Number eight. Use log errors to suppress SQL errors at the row level. So in general, when you execute a non-query DML statement, insert, update, delete, and it modifies or could modify more than one row, it's an all or nothing situation. Either all the rows are modified successfully or none of them are. So when error occurs in the SQL engine, it rolls back all the changes that were made in that statement and then passes an exception back out to PL SQL or whatever invoked the SQL statement. But what if you've got a situation where you're updating thousands and thousands of rows, a single update statement updates a million rows, you get through 900,000 of those row changes, and then an error occurs and you don't want to lose all the work you just did. In that case, you can add the log errors clause to your DML statement. When that happens, then any of the errors that occur at the row level are written out to an error log table and the DML statement runs to completion. Afterwards, if you use the log errors clause, you must, you must, you must check that error log table to see if anything went wrong because with log errors, the SQL engine will not pass an error back to the PL SQL engine for processing. In addition, if you decide to use log errors in the error logging table, you should also enhance the default behavior. We'll take a look at all of this at a fairly high level inside Live SQL. So I've created a script to demonstrate how you can suppress errors at the, at the row level in a DML statement using the log errors clause. Now, first what I'm gonna do is create a table of employees as copied from the HR employee schema, since that's a read-only schema, and I wanna make changes. Next, I will create an error log table. So using the DBMS error log package, I create an error log table associated with the employees table. Looking at statement three, you can see the structure of the table that was created. An error log table always has five columns with a dollar sign at the end, recording the error information, error code, error message, row ID, operation type, optional tag. And then for any column that's compatible with VARCAR2, Oracle will add a column of the same name, data type VARCAR2 4000, and it will store the values from the columns that were in place when the error occurred inside the error logging table. Now in statement four, we see what happens when you don't use log errors. In other words, the all or nothing situation. So first I see how many people in my employees table make more than $24,000 salary. And the answer is none. Then I try to update all the employees and give them a salary that's 200 times their current salary. Wow, nice company. And then afterwards I check to see how many people now make that level of salary or above 24,000. Now the problem here is that at least one person in the employee's table has a salary high enough that you can't multiply it by 200 and still have a valid salary amount. So as you can see, the update statement caused an error to be thrown from the SQL engine. As a result, the after count is the same as before. Nobody's making that much money. Hmm. Well, what if we do want to allow the updates to be applied to whomever can have that 200 times salary increase? Moving on to statement five. Now I've added the log errors clause to my update statement. Notice I'm saying, I don't care how many errors occur, keep on going, reject, limit, unlimited. And now we see very different behavior. Two things to notice. Number one, there is no error. I, have an ex I don't have an exception section and there's no error thrown, this, this block proceeds to completion successfully. And notice that the after count is different than the before count. 49 rows were now updated in the employees table and the other set were not updated. And instead what happened? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the error log table. In statements six and seven, I show both the count in the table. So 58 rows were not able to be updated. 58 plus 49 is 107 which as I'm sure you all know, is the number of rows in the most modern employees table in the HR schema. So 58 failures, and I show you in statement seven, the first nine rows, they're all the same in this case because they all had the same error, but obviously in the real world, they could vary by row. So in all cases, the value that I tried to assign to the salary was too large for the specified precision. Notice the row ID, and then as you can see, the last name and other information is also stored in that row to help you understand what went wrong and possibly recover.
So I was able to update a selective number of rows in my table without the whole thing failing. Now what do I do? Well, looking at statement eight, the most important thing to do is look at the error log table after your code is run and probably move anything in the error log table to your real error logging table for the application so you don't lose it. And then clear out that error log table because when it, the next DML statement runs against the employees table, this error log table could be updated with more rows and you want to be able to distinguish between the rows from the previous statement and the rows from the current statement. In statement nine, you can see that if you don't want to, to allow an unlimited number of errors, you can specify a limit. In other words, I'm updating 10,000 rows. If I have at least 100 errors, something's gone wrong and I want to stop. And then it will throw an exception and terminate the DML statement. So that's the basic idea with log errors. You add it to your DML statement and then it will allow you to preserve modifications to individual rows, even if some of the rows cannot be modified and throw errors. Just remember, you've got to check that error log table immediately after using log errors in your DML statement to make sure you don't ignore the fact that errors occurred.